Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Kristen Snowden, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist therapist in the state of California. And um, as Scott said, this is a webinar that just tries to cover all topics that come up in um, my private practice as I deal with um, very severe couples issues, addiction, infidelity, uncovering, just run of the mill, common problems that I see in all humans, all relationships, uh, struggles with setting boundaries, holding boundaries, wondering, is this my trauma showing up or is this my real instincts and intuition? How do I communicate my wants and needs? What are my wants and needs and everything um, and so forth. So we try to cover all things that we never learn in school. We just learn by trial and error and kind of muddling through this crazy world called engaging with other imperfect human beings. It gets messy. We sometimes need to raise our hand, wave the white flag, ask for help. And that's what one of these free offerings is for. So today's topic is around grief, loss, and the big question, can I ever forgive a betrayal? Can I ever forgive someone hurting me so much. Um, this topic came up because I regularly run workshops. Um, I'm a Brene Brown certified Daring Way facilitator, and I was running groups on Brene Brown's rising strong content. And so we talk about how when we're coming, rising strong from a really big face down fall, something really painful, hurtful, embarrassing, shameful, um, we have to rumble with various topics, um, topics around criticism, shame, our trauma, um, living big, as she says. But one topic that really stuck with my workshop group is the topic around rumbling with grief, loss, and forgiveness. Now, as you can imagine, my, most of my participants are female betrayed partners of sex addicts, porn addicts, or, um, or severe infidelity. And these are really, really messy topics, topics that they get really, really stuck on, as you can imagine. So I wanted to devote a webinar. I'm kind of talking about this further, helping you begin the conversation, develop a language for all these really messy, painful emotions that we might be going through when we're walking through grief loss and this idea of what forgiveness is. How, how do I forgive? How do I forgive myself? What do I need to forgive regarding myself? How do I need to forgive another person when they've hurt me so much, when there's been such deep betrayal and how to move through those emotions? So um, one of the great quotes that Brene Brown uses in this section is from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and I'm going to start with that. He writes on grief and forgiveness. To forgive is not just to be altruistic. It is the best form of self-interest. It is also a process that does not exclude hatred and anger. These emotions are all a part of being human. You should never hate yourself for hating others who have done horrible things. The depth of your love is shown by the extent of your anger and your hurt. However, when I talk of forgiveness, I mean the belief that you can come out the other side as a better person, a better person than the one being consumed by that anger and hatred and hurt. Remaining in that state locks you in a state of victimhood, making you almost dependent on that perpetrator. If you can find it in yourself to forgive, then you are no longer chained to that perpetrator. You can move on and you can even help the perpetrator to become a better person too. So I'm fast forwarding to the end, but I want you to never hear that when I'm talking about subjects of grief, loss, and forgiveness, the answer is never let go, forget, um, get over it, because that's just not possible. Um, your anger, your hurt, your pain is validated. And actually, with all the those who research the concepts of grief and loss and moving through forgiveness and moving through all these emotions, the biggest problem is that we aren't comfortable 
with honing in and focusing in and acknowledging these really messy emotions, the sadness, the deep loss, the deep longing. And that really the answer is that if we could create a culture that is more comfortable with these messy emotions, then we might be able to move through grieving a lot more effectively, a little bit more gracefully, instead of being stuck in the state for a long time. So I just want to bring this back to, again, recovering from betrayal. I had a client a while back who um, found out about her partner's infidelity and the, the partner, the husband was going to move out. So she found herself talking to her sister, just saying, look, this is what's happening. Um, this is what led to us separating. There's infidelity. And she said that her sister just quickly moved into what she described as just very gossipy, wanting to know the details, you know, oh, how could he do this? Wh who is this person? Why? Oh my gosh, I can't imagine you guys getting divorced. All I know is the two of you being together. What am I going to do? And, and the, the woman, the client telling the story was just kind of like, I was in awe. I'm in this deep pain and suffering and struggle. And I'm going to my sister for listening, compassion, holding space for my deep loss and pain. And all she could do is just kind of make it about herself. Um, conversely, she called a friend who'd been through some deep suffering and pain as well. And instead there was this response of just like, oh my gosh, this is devastating. I am so sorry that this is happening to you. How can I help? What do you need me to do? Do you want me to show up? And she just noted the juxtaposition between those two responses. Someone who just was so dysregulated and so upset and, and then turned it towards themselves and just kind of wanted to know superfluous details that weren't necessary at that time in that moment. Um, and there wasn't a focus on my client who was in the deep pain, deep despair and deep anguish. While there was this other friend who was able to hold space for just the messiness of how hurt she was, how scared she must be, all the really painful emotions. And Brene Brown would say that that is an example of someone who's done her own work. We cannot hold space for someone else's grief, loss, and pain if we are not also comfortable with doing our own work, facing our own demons, and sitting in the discomfort, the discomfort, the dysregulation, the pain of just like, this is a horrible thing that's happening to my friend and I can't do a darn thing to fix it. There's nothing. All I can do is just sit here and listen. I hope I don't say the wrong thing. I hope I can help in just the most basic ways, but I can't fix this pain and suffering. But unfortunately, our culture does not do a very good job with um, teaching us to hold space for those really uncomfortable uncomfortable emotions of grief and loss. We, we do a lot of platitudes, which um, that word, I was looking it up because I couldn't remember it today, what that word was. I always forget it for some reason, but it's, you know, it's like when someone dies, oh, there's another angel in heaven, or, you know, it's uh, when that door closes, another, a window opens. And there's just kind of these things that we do to, to skip out on the pain and suffering that someone might be going through and just kind of you give a platitude. And I, I, I was looking up the definition and it said it's a remark or statement, especially one of moral content that has been used so often that it lacks interest or thoughtfulness. <laughs> it's like, wow, isn't that so interesting that, you know, and so of course you can imagine if it, it, it's been used so often and it's just almost like a scripted response. Like when you say, oh, hey, how are you? And someone just kind of says, oh, fine it doesn't impact your soul. It doesn't change you. It doesn't help in any way. It's just this platitude. It's just a script that we have to kind of get through our day in the regular moments. And I just, I just noticed that, that, that with a messy emotion that needs community, it needs to be witnessed. It's, it's unfortunate that our culture has just kind of only given us the tools of go-to platitudes. Oh, you're in my prayers, my condolences, my thoughts and prayers go out to you. Uh, 
these are platitudes that for better or worse, it's maybe because we don't want to say the wrong thing. We're scared of saying the wrong thing. We are uncomfortable with their discomfort. We just kind of say these scripted responses. And the problem with that is that when we haven't done our work on these topics, when we are in these messy emotions of grief, loss, and longing, I'll talk a little bit more about those. If we don't put a name to them, acknowledge them, and process them, instead, we just kind of, we lock them up and think, oh, whatever, you know, put a platitude ribbon on top of it, it's dealt with they will leak out in other ways. They leak out that that shame, grief, loss, and hurt instead ooze out in over or under eating, perfectionism, over or under functioning in life, addiction, rage, et cetera. So you have got to process these messy, messy emotions. And as a side note too, I want to note that grief of all the different emotions that I walk with people through it is, yes, indeed, one of the most messiest. It is also not linear in any kind of way, right? There's no like every day I take a step forward or better. It's three steps forward, five steps back, six steps forward, 10 steps back. You get hit blindsided by that song, that anniversary. Um, the look on someone's face brings you all back to the pain again. And so you have to really respect the randomness that that grief occurs in. Um, you can't put a darn timeline on it. You can't say, all right, six months, I need to be over this. Or as we hear in couples therapy after infidelity, it's been a year already. When are you going to get over it? We have to take that pain and listen to it and say, what is happening here? So Brene Brown talks about what is happening here. We have, she's noticed when people are going through grief and loss, um, there's a couple components to it. There is this component of grief, despair, sadness, these deep, visceral, physical feelings, physical anguish in your body, like down to the bone of pain and loss. I'm sure many of you listening can resonate with this feeling of like not even knowing the human body could suffer in the way that you've suffered, not even knowing that. A, a person could be as sad as the sadness you're experiencing. That is deep grief, despair, and anguish. And that can come from the loss of something very tangible, like a loss of a partner, loss of a job, um, a, a loss of something that's very meaningful in our life, but then also something that's really intangible. Like I have to let go of a dream that I thought I was going to do um, a, a belief of, of who I thought this person was, but now I need to come to terms that they are not that person and they cannot provide this thing in my life that I needed. Um, I, a loss of something that we knew to be true, but maybe isn't true anymore. A belief that we had that we're realizing isn't true. Um, a love that we had that has gone away. Uh, counting on someone and having them disappoint us. Uh, those are all things that will trigger loss. Um, and the thing is, is that, that loss creates this kind of gaping hole in your life. And if you don't acknowledge that gaping hole, that loss that was created by what happened, that hole will just grow and grow and grow. Other components that she saw um, as she kind of processed through understanding grief and extrapolating it is this deep longing and yearning. So often this longing and yearning is something that we just didn't even know that we needed and wanted until it's gone. And then we just want it so much from the depths of our soul for it to have never have happened, for me to never have known what sadness feels like for me to never know what kind of suffering um, I'm capable of feeling, um, for me to not know that I'm capable of hurting someone so much and harming them and disrupting their life so much, that deep longing and yearning. And it can come up again so randomly out of nowhere. 
and kind of strike you and paralyze you at times. And then there's also just this feeling of loss, of being lost, needing and requiring because that gaping hole exists in me is a reorientation around my new reality, um, a readjustment of my identity. This is what I thought I was. For instance, that if I identified a lot of myself and value around being a wife and then suddenly I'm getting divorced, there's going to be a giant reorientation of, well, then who am I? When I get up and I'm, or I used to orient my mind towards my partner, the schedule, my kids, what's going on in this way of life is completely crumbled and disintegrated and now has to be reframed to something different. It's a readjustment of our new identity, a rebuilding, a restructuring around that, around values and worth and what I want in life and how do I get there and just things that our brain has never had to reach beyond its current limitations to get to. That is the grief and loss and yearning process. So they find that when you're trying to move through grief and loss, the important parts are A, having witnesses, but B, moving to that, moving through that new orientation, finding um, meaning and maybe not the bad thing that happened, but the gratitude of, of little pieces that, that have come as a part of this journey. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but you always have to acknowledge the loss and longing. Now let's talk for a minute about forgiveness. And she's, what I really like what she says is that in order for forgiveness to happen, something has to die. So forgiveness in the way she describes it, it's not this like state of being where it's just like, I forgive you you know, what you did was horrible, but now I forgive you. She's saying what has to happen is that there's got to be almost a death, right? That like the gaping hole has occurred. It's not going to fill up. And the only thing you can do is, is reorient and readjust around it for a rebirth, something new, some reorientation, some re new framework. So in order to move through forgiveness. And we have to move through the grief, the hopes, the dreams, the trust, the former reality all has to be mourned. It has to die. So for those who might be a betrayed partner here, or um, in, a, in those two addicts in recovery as well, you have to really explore what do I have to let die in order to move through the grief? You know, what do I, what have I held on to an expectation, a former reality that now has to be shattered and kind of reframed um, hopes or expectations or dreams that I had goals, et cetera, a uh, ways that I would view myself and want others to perceive me and my life as what kind of things do I need to let go of in those areas so that I can move towards forgiveness. You know, for, we talked about this briefly in one of the groups, but some of the betrayed partners have a lot of grief and anguish around how they have responded to the betrayal, to finding out about the addiction. And there is this deep grief that it's like, oh, I always imagined I would respond so definitively. You know, we all say when we're kids, oh, if if my partner ever cheated on me, I'd be out, you know, I'd get over that. And then there's this almost grief that it's like, it's not that easy. We have life. We have kids. I, I love this person. And there's this, this grief and loss that I have to acknowledge that it's a lot more complicated. And, and when I'm in a state of dysregulation, fear, hurt, I maybe don't show up as the, the Kristen that I wish I'd constantly showed up with, sometimes stuff flies out of my mouth and sometimes items fly out of my hand and I get angrier and I lose my temper, not just with my partner for what he or she did, but it leaks into how I show up at work or I can't remember things as well as I want to, or how I show up with my kids. There is this like grief and loss 
and, and reorientation that has to move and self-forgiveness, self-forgiveness that I have to move through to get through that grief process. So um, Robert Niemeyer, who's a, um, a grief uh, researcher, says a central process in grieving is the attempt to reaffirm or reconstruct a world of meaning that has been challenged by loss. And I'm just going to close out with that, that quote to let you know that grief is not supposed to be done in isolation. In fact, I'm going to argue the research shows it cannot. You will not be able to move through grief, loss, pain without having some safe witnesses who are able to hear you, sit with the pain, um, not tell you what you should do, not try to get gossipy details about it like they're watching a bad soap opera but actually just sit with it in the pain so that you can move, acknowledge, process, and move through it. Um, I know, you know, sexandrelationshiphealing.com has a lot of great workshops. I have Betrayed Partners workshops. I also do those Brene Brown, Daring Way, and Rising Strong workshops. These are really great tools and mediums for you to come with your pain and your grief and have people witness it that can hold space for it, right? That don't freak out when they hear what your partner's done, that don't have so much judgment when you say you want to hang, you know, stick around in the relationship and see how the recovery healing process goes. So I just want to finish with that part that this grief loss and moving to forgiveness has to be done with a safe community and with witnesses around it. And it needs to be talked and processed and acknowledged. And there's no timeline. So don't set specific parameters around it because it is not linear. It is messy and sporadic and you'll get, you'll feel like you're on the right path and then you'll get struck down really quickly and start over in some other category. And that is it. Um. Thank you, Kristen. Um, this has been the topic of the week for <laughs> whatever reason. It's grief, loss, and forgiveness. Um, I've been dealing with it, you know, uh, personally and professionally, like for a week. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's funny how this always comes together. Um, I love the quote that you open with. Was that you said it was uh, Desmond Tutu? Right. I mean, basically to me, it boils down to if, is, if I can't forgive you, I'm going to forever be your victim. Um, and I don't want to be a victim forever. There's, I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters, uh, 30s, 40s. I think it came out in the early 40s. Um, and it's letters from Uncle Screwtape, who's a senior demon, and to his nephew Wormwood, who's like a junior demon. And Uncle Screwtape is mentoring him and telling him that. I, um, and he talks about resentment, which is a lack of forgiveness to me. Um, and he said, if you can get somebody to have even a tiny resentment, you know, you'll own a piece of their soul. And to me, this lack of forgiveness, if I can't forgive you, you will forever own a piece of my soul. And, you know, I may not want you to own a piece of my soul. If you've been that evil to me, um, you know, like Desmond Tutu, I mean, he was, he really had some <laughs> things to be angry about. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want those people owning a piece of my soul. So forgiveness really is, as you said, a selfish thing more than a selfless thing. It's, it's more about me than, than the people I'm angry with. Um, it's, it's finding some peace within myself. Um, and acceptance. And, and I do think grief is a huge part of that. So um, great topic. Thank you. Um, let's jump into the Q&A because we got a bunch of them already. Um, so um, hi to both of you. Hello. Um, can my nervous system calm down even if my husband isn't in recovery and I continue to stay with him for certain reasons, which a lot of people do choose to do? Yeah. Um yeah, the answer is just a lot more complicated. It, it's hard to so like completely heal a nervous system when it constantly needs to be on high alert. You're you're looking for nonverbal cues or body language or behavior that might lead you to believe that he's putting you in harm's way or lying to you. Um, so though 
that's going to be really hard to heart, um, heal the nervous system in that respect and not get really upregulated around your partner. However, outside of the partner environment, you always have opportunities to seek down regulation. I mean, I'm assuming by you using this language that you've watched my YouTubes on like the autonomic nervous system and the various menu of tools that you can use to down regulate it. Um, any kind of mind body connection, deep breathing exercises, meditation, yoga, things that, that, that try to keep you inward and focused on your mind and body connection that gets you out of that hyper vigilant state of, of looking at your environment and, and your nervous system freaking out going, do you need to run? Do you need to fight? Do you need to fawn? And all these kind of, um, reactionary, um, behaviors. Um if my betraying partner, this is the addict, or the, if the addict says, I'm unable to love you, I can't give you any reassurance or similar affirmation, should I, the betrayed partner, um, continue working on relationship skills right now? Um, you know, and going through exercises and webinars, it seems like those are for, for when both partners are committed. He has admitted to ambivalence, and I believe he's deep in shame too. We're now considering a therapeutic separation. I'm afraid of being more hurt because he's not in a place of providing any healing for us. At the same time, it feels like I'm giving up if we stop working on the relationship, if we stop the relationship exercises. Mm -hmm. um, um, what's coming up for me is when you are seeking out help from other, from groups or engaging um, in these relationship exercises, you're, you're learning life skills and you're developing a language that's going to help you no matter what happens in the relationship. Um, you know, one thing that I always say is one of the worst casualties of betrayal is your instincts and intuition. And you can do a lot of relationship tools, just even if my addict is still acting out, I now will see his or her behavior with eyes wide open and go, Oh, that that's that gaslighting that I used to like kind of kowtow to and respond and fawn to, but now I can set boundaries and I can say, you know, I'm, I'm not buying that today. That's that that's your story. It's not mine. We're going to have to agree to disagree, um, set up boundaries. So, um, I always respect people's desire to stay if they feel like today they need to stay and I respect people's desire to leave should they say it's time to leave and um, I think it's a really organic process and you, there's no harm or shame in staying if you're not ready to leave um, you said I'm afraid of being more hurt and that's so much about what we're talking about here with this grief and loss there of course you're going to be hurt you're going to be deeply hurt. There's a lot of fear about moving towards separation because it's a world you've, you've never done and you have to deal with a reorientation and refiguring out who you are and what life would look like. And that's exactly this, this grieving loss longing process that is required that I understand why you're afraid. It's deeply uncomfortable, possibly the most uncomfortable thing you'll ever do. Um, but it might be necessary eventually. Yeah, and, and I just want to add, this is not, not a hopeless situation. Um, most addicts come into recovery, or, or at least after D-Day, whether they're going into recovery or not, um, they've spent a very, very long time not feeling their feelings. Um, and I'm speaking as an addict, I spent 25 years not feeling anything. I used my addiction to numb out perpetually, any kind of emotional discomfort, I treated, I self-medicated with alcohol or drugs or sex or porn. Um, so when it all crashed down around me and I was certainly not ready to give it up because it was my coping mechanism, it was the solution, not the problem, don't you know? Um, a, lot of, a lot of addicts come into recovery with, with that. You know, this isn't the problem. This is my solution to my problems, even though it's causing all my problems. <laughs> but we forget that part. It's very convenient. Um, I couldn't identify my own feelings or, or give myself any compassion. How could I feel your feelings with you? You know, how could I display empathy? I can't even figure out what I'm feeling. How can I figure out what you're feeling and I actually care about? 
I'm not ready yet. So for your betraying partner to say, I can't give you what you need right now is actually a, a bit of honesty. That gives me hope. At least he's not pretending anymore. He's saying, I'm not capable right now. Um, maybe he will get there. Maybe he won't. But I totally agree with Kristen. The work that you're doing is for you. Um, any work that he does is for him. And the work that you do is for you. You know, normally um, we recommend, and I, I, I suspect Kristen does the same, is you get your therapy and support, he gets his therapy and support. And when you're both a little bit grounded, then we come together and and spend time working on the couple. Um, but he's not ready to work on the couple right now. He may not even be ready to work on himself right now. And he's got to do some work on himself before he's ever going to be able to be honest or to empathize with you. Um, but it doesn't mean he can't do it. It doesn't mean he can't come around or won't at some point. Um, I, Kristen, I'm sure you've seen, you know, addicts who you think are never going to get it. And then suddenly something clicks and it's like, whoa, <laughs> who is this prod person? Um, but then there are also guys who never come around, sadly. So yeah. I don't know. Um, and yeah. sometimes when there is that kind of insanity cycle going on, like, you know, relapse, I can't help you you not ready to leave. Um, sometimes we step out and go, is there a way we can change the system? Is there something that can be done that can kind of just put a little, you know, little drop of dye in that giant pitcher of water and see if it can just change what's going on a little bit. And so sometimes a therapeutic separation or, you know, something else can at least just alter the system that you feel like you're not doing the definition of insanity over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've seen situations where the therapeutic separation finally flipped the switch. It's like, oh, you're not here um, taking care of me, both emotionally and physically. Suddenly I have to go live in some, you know, fly-by-night hotel. And it's I realize how much I miss you. Sometimes that that will click for a guy and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so, but, but yeah, I, I'm all for shaking it up a little bit. If nothing changes, nothing changes, you know. Um, so, um, okay, next one, uh, wife of a sex addict, uh, D-Day was 11 years ago. Um, I've stayed with my husband throughout our marriage for a lot of reasons, uh, the usual kind of reasons, kids, et cetera. Um, fast forward to now, I have been in recovery for over two years. I have boundaries. I'm on an app sets couch. That's a specialist in partners of sex addicts. Um, I go to a lot of meetings. I'm doing my work. Uh, my husband is not in recovery, but he is sober for a month and a half now, and he feels like I'm not being fair to him because for years I have done nothing while he was in active addiction. So he feels that now he is sober, I should be past this. Um, how do I get past the shame of staying in the marriage? And how do I clarify to my husband that being sober is not enough? <laughs> he is confused. Um, thank you. And sorry, this question is so long. Um, I'm I'm smiling and sort of giggling because it's it's like I, I mostly work with addicts. Kristen, I think, mostly works with betrayed partners. I mostly work directly with addicts, um, educating them. I'm not a therapist, but I do a lot of teaching. And uh, you know, I'm like, guys, your husband or your wife, you know, you've known about your acting out forever. <laughs> You're kind of feeling relieved right now. Your wife just got hit by a truck. Give her a break. Um, <laughs> You know, um, yeah, uh, I mean, the guys, they don't get it. And, and so anyway, Kristen, <laughs> question to you. Yes, you're right. It's a common sentence. Like, okay, I came clean. Can we now just move forward, right? Because we don't want to go to the past. The past has lots of really yucky emotions where I have to admit to things that I don't want to admit to. Scott earlier uh, um, said earlier, I've been really I the addict, meaning being very invested in not feeling my emotions, being in my body, you know, reviewing the past 20 years of choices that I've made in my life, because that's blah. Then I have to grieve and move through all that stuff that I'm not the person I thought I would be, that I'm capable of doing all these horrible things. Um, grieve also that I'm capable of hurting you and watching you be in pain around it. So I just rather just like say, Hey, I'm good now. Can you just take my word for it? And I'd like to just move forward from here. Can you just take my word for it? So I'm just validating that this is common 
but you do have the right, and especially hopefully after hearing this um, webinar, you realize how important it is to name the emotions, name the hurt, name the, the struggles. I mean, there's a reason in the 12 steps that there's um, a step four, five, six, seven. These are saying, it's not just saying, okay, I'm powerless. I need help. Please step in and help me. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, we need to go back and remember what has happened exactly. What are the patterns that we're seeing? What are the character defects that led to these behaviors? Because we all need to know it, A, just to name it, because this kind of stuff needs witnesses. It needs validation, hopefully needs closure. But it's also important for you, the, par um, the betrayed partner, to it makes you feel safer actually when they, when their defenses are so low and their shame has been uh, dealt with and worked through, that is a new person in recovery that can be like, yeah, I can own what I've done. I can own that. It was terrible and I'm horrible. And yeah. And I can sit with you. What do you need me to do um, to help you feel safe right now? That, that is an example of someone who's done enough work that they can do messy feelings and a person who does messy feelings and sits with messy feelings and makes good coping choices around them tends to not relapse. And that makes that betrayed partner feel safer. So I don't know if that helps. First of all, I've never can guess when someone is done. Um, my biggest job as a therapist walking through either addiction recovery or couples in crisis, deciding to stay together or not, or betrayed partners deciding to stay or not, I've learned to just hold space because I have grown a level of confidence in knowing that there's just something that happens inside them that just seems to kind of click and they just go, I'm done now. I don't want to be here anymore. Um, the, you know, Tammy and I have said this a couple of times in our webinar that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is just apathy. And so I hear a lot of like, you know, I want you to get recovery. Our kids need you. Um, but I don't really care anymore whether or not you go to those meetings. I have no desire to check your phone anymore. Um, I just, you know, let's, let's co-parent. Let's get, get along as best as we can. But I, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't care anymore. I don't care that you, you're going to therapy. I don't care. Like, because there's just this like, um, release of, you know, again, to speak of Brene Brown. And I think this has to do with grief and loss also is she talks about this thing called generosity, which betrayed partners and many people have an issue with, which is the fact that if I really believed this person was doing the best they can today, like they didn't wake up to make my life hell. This is them in their limited capacity in their emotional stuntedness. This is the best that they can offer me today. How do I need to restructure and reboundary my life, knowing and acknowledging these limitations, these strengths and weaknesses. And it's this idea that I've come to terms with, with your limitations, or I've come to terms that this is this is my bandwidth, as you said, I've reached my, my limit and my bandwidth. How, how would I know? And it's just, there's this lack of strong, there's this lack of desire to manipulate the situation because you're invested in a very specific outcome happening. Um, there's less of that longing and yearning that we talked about in this grief and loss process. So this less like, why won't you just get it? Why won't you just get it? And there's kind of more of this, like, this is just not, he's not able to do this. So there's signs like that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Scott. I mean, I, I tell the, I mean, again, I usually work with the guys and I tell them this, I, I'm like, I, I say, when your partner stops yelling, it's over. You know, she's, she or he has given up and the relationship part of your relationship is over. That's when you know you're in trouble. It's over. If she's still yelling at you, she wants to be with you. She still cares enough to yell at you. We don't yell at people we don't care about. Um, we just say, okay, I'm done. And we move on. Um, yeah. So, I mean, as far, as far as reaching your limit, yeah. I mean, it's just when you just say, okay, I'm done. Clearly you've hit your limit. <laughs> yeah. Or I've grieved, you know, like that Desmond Tutu uh, arguments, like anger is an extension of my passion and pain and feelings towards the situation. But if I've worked through it, 
and I've kind of just, just come to terms and accepted that this is who you are. And these are the limitations of this relationship. I, what, what do I have to yell about anymore? I'm not, I can't change it. And there's just, there's a switch that happens. Okay. Um, just through a divorce after 45 years, uh, sorry to hear that. Um, from a sex addict uh, who acted out at all three levels, relapsed 15 times in four years, shows little remorse, lives in meism, not weism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yet he's in therapy at 12 step. I'm doing all my work, lots of heavy lifting, but I am such, but I am in such deep grief and loss um, for the person I thought I knew. He is not safe. Um, I have nightmares of loss, fear, and what he did. How long will this howling grief and pain last? Um, what, what work should I do to move through this and speak my truth? Before I turn this over to Kristen, I just want to say, um, Barbara Steffens and Marsha Means did a study of portray partners of male sex addicts, and they found that they suffer almost universally symptoms of post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. And you just described symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So I want you to know you're not alone, and I want to validate this, yeah, I want to validate what you're going through. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I see trauma healing that's required in this, this and shame resiliency that is required in this. And then this grief and loss stuff, which the trauma healing, um, if you've watched any of my other videos on the autonomic nervous system or on betrayal trauma and, and ways to treat it, um, there's EMDR, IFS, somatic experience, you know, so EMDR is eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. Um, there's neurofeedback that has really great um, uh, research around healing the brain so it doesn't have a full traumatic response. Um, you know, it's kind of that idea of like the soldier that, you know, is in an environment where there's bombing and, and, and shells and then they hear they're back home and they're technically safe, but then they hear a plane fly over and they just instinctively go jump under a table, right? We're talking about that, that, that song on the radio, that driving down that street, that hearing your ex's voice doesn't really throw you into that trauma response. So that can help you with that, that pain and the trauma triggering, but then also have you been able to share your story? Has your, your level of pain and despair and anguish and grief been written and witnessed um, and shared. And I'd encourage you to look up the various um, betrayed partners, grief and loss groups. Um, I have one coming up actually uh, November 2nd, where we're going to be processing very, a lot of things, but we're going to save space for processing further the grief and loss. If you could think of grief as like when something significant happens and I lose something and a dream, a hope, a person in my life, an identity that I don't have anymore, <clears throat> it creates a, a hole in your body and you, you reorient and you restructure and you rebuild around that hole. So it's not such a gaping wound, but it still exists, you know? So and it still will kind of hit you out of no, uh, nowhere sometimes. And it doesn't mean you're not over it. It doesn't mean that you're going backward. It's just how grief and loss works. Um, and, you know, I, th I think I've said that like, uh, Glenn and Joy always says, my grief is just the receipt that shows that I loved, that, that this person, that this goal or that this dream, that this reality that's no longer my reality, this identity that's no longer my identity, it meant something to me. And so things will trigger the memory, the loss, the longing, the yearning, and it, there's no linear fashion to it. Um, will it become less and less or not so overwhelming? Probably. The more that you go through it, you get more used to that. But that's kind of like saying, you know, if you lost a loved one, like, do you ever get over the loss? I'm going to say, no, you, you come to terms with it, the loss, you kind of rebuild a whole other set of realities around it. You make meaning from it, but you don't ever like, oh, well, that's all done. You know, that, like the song still reminds you of the loss. That, that, that anniversary still reminds you of the loss. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just 
humanity. Okay, my husband has been in AA for decades without any relapses. Um, now he attends SLAA meetings. Um, I feel like he knows what to say and what to do because he's basically grown up in 12 steps programs, but he has horrendously betrayed me for decades. Now he seems to be doing what he is supposed to, but doesn't seem to be really emotionally connected to the work. Um, I never see any real guilt or true remorse. I feel like the previous 12 step work has given him a way to keep the issues at arm's length thoughts. It's an interesting question. Right. No, that's really well said and something I think Scott can definitely talk on too, but we can uh, self-help book our way <laughs> through life, right? Like, especially therapists, we yeah. can talk a good talk because I can put the charts and, oh, I need to use my communication skills. And, oh, these are my traumas that are being triggered right now. Let's de-escalate. And, <laughs> right. Let's de I need to do my deep breathing exercises. But we're notoriously like the worst clients of all because we can talk a good talk and know logically in our head what's happening and what, what's going on and what I'm supposed to do, but my heart and soul aren't changed. Um, and so you and I talk about that in that Life Anonymous book, the difference right. between like behavioral changes that, oh, I'm going to go to meetings and I'm going to have sponsors and, or I'm going to have sponsees now that I've worked the steps and I don't pick up an alcoholic beverage. But by the way, if I am not drinking but I'm still lying and leading a double life and sneaking around and manipulating and using really poor coping skills and going against my values and commitments. I'm not in recovery. Yeah. I'm not in recovery. I'm not drinking, but that's about it. And so I understand your frustration with, with the, it's not the 12 steps problem. <laughs> it's the fact that your partner is really good at checking off the bullet points, looking, you know, talking the talk, using those isms, but not actually letting it sink into his or her soul that what they've done is not okay. Um, that they're kind of full of SHIT. And I just love to hear what you have to say about that, because I'm sure you run into that all the time. You're totally right. I mean, uh, we call these guys dry drunks. They show up, they talk the talk, they, they walk the walk, except they don't really walk the walk. Uh, <laughs> you know, they check the boxes. And, but they're still jerks. Um, their the only behavior that's changed is they're no longer drinking. And like in your husband's, husband's case, he stopped drinking, but he sure as, you know what, didn't stop cheating. Um, or maybe he switched to cheating, which is another addiction. Um, you can be sober in one addiction and very active in another. And it sounds like this is what happened. Um, you know, I had to, I'm an alcoholic, drug addict, sex addict, porn addict. I had to get sober from all of them before I was able to really make deep and meaningful changes. And it started with stopping all of the addictive behaviors. Then it was a change in thinking, which which 12 step work is very good with. And then eventually it drops from the head to the heart. And I start feeling, you know, real guilt and true remorse. And I start expressing empathy. But it was a couple of years of full sobriety from everything before I was really empathetic for other people. Um, because I was so shut down. Addiction is, I don't want to feel emotional discomfort. I don't want to feel emotions at all. So I shut it down and I forget how to do it. I mean, 25 years of active addiction for me, I had no idea how to feel when I got into recovery, um, let alone feel guilty or, or feel remorse, which are painful feelings, which I don't want to feel. Um, so yeah, I mean, we see this all the time. Um, and this is a relatively common pattern in sexual recovery programs is some people come in with decades of sobriety from substances and they're like, damn, <laughs> you know, I was sober from alcohol and drugs, but I wasn't sober. I mean, he, he probably knows he wasn't sober. He's well aware he wasn't sober. Um, and it's going to take him some time to make the emotional changes that ideally would have been made, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so yeah, Kristen is totally on point with that. Um, so um, we are out of time. Um, so sorry, we didn't get to all the questions, but we got to the vast majority. <laughs> um, 
thank you all for being here. Um, Kristen, thank you for volunteering your time and your expertise. Um, it was fun to be here. I don't get to see you very often. So always lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I always have my email, uh, Kristen Snowden, MFT at Gmail. If you have any questions or my website, Kristen Snowden.com. Um, any follow-ups or ideas? Yeah. And just, just to remind everybody, Kristen does the Brene Brown trainings that you do Daring Way and Rising Strong both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have personally done the Daring Way training, not with Kristen, but it, it was life changing. Um, so if you're interested, definitely go to Kristen's site. And, and do you have any coming up? Yeah, I do. I have one starting November 2nd. There's three or four spots left. So if you're thinking about it, hop on the site now and register because there's only a few spots yeah. left. But this yeah. one's going to be the Daring Greatly. And we're going to add a little extra about the grief and loss and letting go and processing that stuff. Nice. Highly recommended. So. Um, okay, everybody, thank you. Um, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.